Um, welcome to uh, HDM Hackers Hangout. It is Friday, October 4th. Um, I want to just go over uh, a couple things. I'm, I'm Matt Taylor. I'm the Menta Community Manager. Um, I've got a little bit of an agenda to go over first. Um, and this is a live, let me explain the meeting first um, a little. First, we'll, we'll go over my whiteboard. So I'm going to talk about real quick for the Hangout, what is this meeting? And then we'll do a quick review of what's going, been going on with Nementa for um, any new audiences coming in here. Um, so first of all, what is this meeting? Um, so we've, I've done this as a monthly way for years, actually. We've done this for years. Um, monthly meetings where we have a live stream. It's usually, it's usually been on Google Hangouts where anyone in the community, and when I say the community, I'm typically mean our mailing lists or our forums. We used to have mailing lists and they turned into forums. So it's now mostly a forum. Um, but I always post it on Twitter too. It's uh, open to anybody. Um, sometimes we'll get, you know, eight or 10 people join. Most of the time it's, you know, four or five, some six, seven, something like that. Um, it always depends on people's uh, uh, agendas and a lot of them are across the ocean, so the timing doesn't work out. But anyway, um, we do this meeting really to sync up with the community and to allow people in the community to bring up issues that they want to talk about with, with me or Nementa specifically. I, I try to pull in um, folks from the research team sometimes. <laughs> Sorry. I try to pull in pe people from the research team sometimes to talk about what they're doing and make them available to take questions and stuff like that too. Um, I'm hoping somebody from research will show up later. Um, uh, this is, we're live right now and when we put the video out later, so I'll, I'll be editing this, uh, for the, for you, Hong Sung. Um, so that's what this meeting is and what I'm going to talk about real quick, uh, is I'm going to switch to this, move my microphone and talk to this, um, whiteboard picture over here. I was thinking about this and there's a lot of people that probably aren't really aware um, of the, the history of what we've been doing because it's we, we tend to have this cycle uh, Numenta, the company that I'm that I work for of um, researching and then um, creating applications of research and then going back to research and then creating applications of research so that's sort of been the cycle uh, that we've been going through for years I entered the company like right around this transition and uh, move and took over as the open source. Let's see. I didn't, I wasn't even working in open source yet. We didn't open source until, was it 2015? So this is when like Nupit came out and uh, that's when the community really started sort of uh, taking, no, no, it was 2013, sorry. <laughs> I've been doing this too long. Get my dates all wrong. It was June, 2013, so it was like right here. When, when NuPic was released. Um, and at the time, we weren't even really focused on research. We had, we were done with research. We had come out, uh, Nementa had, before I even joined, they had, they were just coming out of this research phase where they had figured out like the sequence memory algorithm essentially on top of spatial pooling. And uh, that depended on these things. So they active dendrites, specifically the bio biological um, inspiration for this like phase of research and what that means for sequence memory uh, in the brain. Then they transitioned to attempt applications of this uh, in you know the um, application space. Most of, mostly focused on anomaly detection because that was what that was something we could do well. We don't predict very well right now without a more realistic cortical structure. I think. Um, but for anomaly detection, um, we, there are actually some interesting applications there, and I still think there are. Um, they're just, uh, a lot of this was early to market, required really fast streams of data, lots, and a lot of folks around this time frame weren't ready to, to stream uh, data. So <laughs> um, anyway, we pulled out of that at some point, and we, we put out a whole bunch of open source application libraries here. There's a ton, a ton of open source stuff came out in this time period around anomaly detection application. And that's a lot of the, what, what you see is legacy Python 2 framework, but this was all, this was all Python 2 set and stuff. Um, so anyway, there was yet another transition into research 
I think it was around 2016 era, but this was really focusing on things. Um, this was when you know Marcus was really involved here and, um, and turning the focus on grid cells, location representation in the hippocampus and around cortex, and then seeing evidence of those types of um, uh, activity patterns in neocortex got us thinking about how how grid cells and the thousand brains sort of works together and all this research was about that it was about object representation um uh how sensory representations are used through movement to build up object representations and uh we've um put out what one two three four papers or something from the during this period so this we were just focused on writing papers honestly so we put out a bunch of papers about this and now we've just recently been transitioning and i've been talking about this to applications again but this time to deep learning and the interesting thing here is that we're not taking this research and trying to apply it to deep learning we're not even trying to apply this at all i think this still has some we've still there's still some legs on research here i think there's still this isn't ready to be turned into applications um, but this is, is what we're still using. We're still using the concepts of active dendrites, essentially the sparsity, active dendrites, continuous learning. That's what we're applying uh, when we're uh, talking about building out these deep learning apps that we're working on now. I have no doubt, um, Jeff's working on a book. At some point, his book's gonna come out um, within the next year, probably. And uh, I have no doubt, at least I fully expect for another transition back into research from Dementa um, at some point in the future. Um, that's just me. That's not like our official company direction, but I'm probably, no, knowing Jeff, he's gonna, he's, he's already leaning to, back into research a little bit, I can tell. Um, so anyway, I hope that's useful. Uh, so since you're on though, Lucas, you said something about uh, that, that paper that you referred to me on Chisek, that was the one that, Mark Brown and others were talking about on the forum. Oh, really? Oh, nice. The, you know, what's it? I got it right here. Can you, can you share the link? Or yeah, something? hold on a sec. It, uh, actually, I'll do this. Um, share. How do I share? There is, there is a chat. Oh, you're screen sharing. All right, that's great. Yeah, um, I haven't read this yet, but this thing, uh, so, like, it seems like part of the motivation from Paul is to take this old idea from neuropsychology of behavior being separated out into perception, cognition, and action, and redefine that sort of in a more integrated way, which mm -hmm. is good, I think. I think that's the right thing to do, it's, and it helps that. I think it's, it aligns with how we think of the brain we're going to do. I haven't read this paper, so, but I, I might. I'm still trying to decide. Um, I'm still on the affordances thing, which is has more to do with with motion. Mm -hmm. But it's super interesting the way he talks about where and what those streams. And I, I, we have to think about it from the standpoint of. Uh, I got to figure out how that. There we go. The the standpoint of um, you know because our our whole opinion is that same circuit. It's the essential circuit. I know there's going to be some local variations of how, how things work in different parts of the cortex because, because the same input is being sent into different parts of the, I mean, that input will, if, if over time, evolution will have that input affect how the circuit works, right? It's going to optimize on whatever type of patterns it's getting. So it doesn't surprise me that there's some variations in the circuit, but I think there's a core circuit that we're trying to define and we have to understand how motion works in that circuit, how object identity works in that circuit, how prefrontal cortex works in that circuit, how, how goals and plans and all that stuff. How does that circuit support all these things? So looking at it from the affordance motion standpoint, sort of in, in the dorsal stream, and then from a body relative reference frame is interesting. Well, what, what is affordance motion? Why is, why is affordance, well, affordance is a term they, they made up. No, not made up, but like associated with emotion or an action or it's something like more complicated than a simple motion. It's, a, it's like a complete end to end, you know, interaction with an, it's hard to define, honestly. 
Okay. I, I think it's to me like you you take an action in the environment and you get feedback and you adjust your next action according to the feedback. So that whole cycle would be the affordance, is that it? Or um, is that a bad definition? I don't know. I, the, 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 the way I read it is the way they're talking about affordance is almost like the representation of something, not not including how it's learned at all, just the representation of, of some action in response to a stimulus. Okay. That's the okay. Importance. Like you have a representation of you throwing a ball in your brain or, or the motions it takes to, to do certain things in your brain. And I think that's the level of, a, kind of, a, of an affordance. Like imagine catching a ball. Affordances would be the, the quick motions that you take to grab the ball, you know, as it comes towards you, whether it's going this direction or that direction or that direction, you know, you do that. You're, you're, you're matching, like the movement you're selecting. This is what I like to think about it. The motion that gets selected, the, we can call it an affordance, similar to object selection when you're moving through an object space. Like if you reach into a dark, a dark box and you make a motion across an object, um, at the, the union that's happening to identify that object, the sensory input is matched against all of, all of your brain space of objects. I think that's the same thing that's happening when you catch a ball, when you like that, you know, right. that, that's the union selection that's happening in real time. Right, right. Same thing, it's, it's object identification. It's, it's motion affordance identification. Whatever that object is that's being stored, it's associated with your senses in space in both ways, right? You've mm -hmm. got a ball and you've got a motion associated with the ball. Like at all times you're representing an object in ventral streams, you're representing objects that you're interacting with. In dorsal streams, you're representing motions that are body-centric in space, right? So that's the big difference. Body-centric reference frames versus object-centric reference frames, right? Okay. But it's the same computation. That's what I'm trying to put all this together in my head. Mm, okay. Does that make sense, Mark? Okay. I believe that you're also seeing not just a binding of different representations, but a a connection between the sensation and the action. So what happens is, is it, he uses the example of going around a tree in front of you. So you're trying to select an action, a motion, and there's these two pass affordances, and you sense this opening, and it connects to the uh, motion to drive towards that opening. So <clears throat> the description you're giving is the, the way that the various uh, sensations are binding together now connect that binding all the way to the generation of an action. Yeah. Okay, that's what I believe the affordance is doing as a gateway to the action. Yeah, so even, so including motivation for action in the representation as well. Well, not in the act, not in the, you have a, a whole constellation of perceptions. Anything could be perceived. But as you're forming the perception, you're also forming the connection to possible actions that would be necessary right now right so that's what i see that the term affordance is it affords you this possible action <laughs> well, it makes sense with respect to because I, I feel like the way we define objects is tied it's uh tied directly to sensory experience and the way we define motions is also tied directly to sensory experience in the same way <clears throat> Or the way the way that they're represented or the way that they're recalled, you know. Anyway, I think that's all I have to say about it. Um, Switching here on the, the, the forum. Mark, do you have anything you want to talk about? I think uh, we had a uh, Kyung Sung Go on a little earlier, but uh, Nobody else was on, so he dropped out. One moment, please. Oh, sure. I'm pedaling as fast as I can on the forum. <laughs> <laughs> Are you looking for something? I am. Okay. Mm. And this isn't live, so I can um, edit some boring stuff out. Oh, good. That helps. Um, Uh, by the way, Mark, this is Lucas Souza. He's a um, machine learning 
research engineer for us. Yeah, I've been following the meetings. Yeah, good. Hey, Mark, nice meeting you, Simon. It's a pleasure. Welcome to the community. Thank you. I've been reading a lot of your stuff in the forums as well. Oh, hopefully it isn't uh, too confusing. Uh, it's a team I, I'm not too familiar with, so it's hard for me. But I hope that soon I'll be a lot more familiar with. Well, it's, part of what's happening is, is that um, I've been doing this for a long time. And I've, I have this, this giant vision of how all the different pieces fit together. And some of it makes sense, some of it doesn't. But um, uh, I've been trying to take pieces of it that seem like the best cohesive whole and put them on the uh, forum. Mm -hmm. And uh, mostly it works. But uh, uh, people are asking questions. I try to fill in this or that piece of it. And it's scattered all over the forum. I've collected it together mostly in the stream that's called the uh, brain diagrams uh, or something like that. I forget the title of it. And uh, I've been working offline here to try to do the key thing, which I think is, is appropriate to HTM, which is the, this, this concept of, um, of hex grids. Uh, it takes the work of Kelvin and ties it to uh, the work of Nementa. Nice. So, um, okay. The, the nice thing about the hex grids thing is I think that it, it's, it, can, it can really work on top of a lot of the things that we believe already. I, I think it could, okay. uh, anyway. Can I, get, can I get the screen? Yeah. Uh, how do I do it? Let me see, share multi one, you should be able to share. Okay, in um, one of the papers I've shared, the, yeah. the paper is, is how brains make meaning, abstract symbol, that, 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 the, this whole thing here. When we're talking about affordances, this has a diagram that shows how in this part of the um, cortex, how the, um, the highest levels of the uh, processing stream, the what where streams where they come together in the temporal lobe are connected through fibers into the uh, planning and action lobe. So mm -hmm. this is what I'm saying when I say the affordances are tied directly together to the performance part of the brain. Mm. Did uh, you say performance part of the brain? Well, if you think about the forebrain, what happens is the down in this section, the, uh, the, the lower frontal lobe, you see the richest connections between the hippocampus, uh, the hypothalamus, uh, the amygdala. Uh, the, the, the lower brain structures heavily are connected to the uh, planning parts of the brain. So I see that what happens is, is from the central sulcus here to this, there you see a... Um, instead of a stream that is elaborated into some higher level detail, you see some higher level detail unfolded until you reach the sulcus and you actually see the motor drives. Mm. So this general plan that drives forward here, about halfway through, there's a connection to the sensory stream. And I see this as being your, your loop of, of consciousness. Uh -huh. So you see some action unfolding, you perceive it, you actually perceive your, yourself thinking of this, and then that goes into your evaluation, which further drives your next planning. Okay, so this unfolding bit going from the lower temp, or lower frontal lobe, it's it is evalu is unfolded into a proto plan, and if you have enough of a um, support from the lower from the, the rest of your brain that's gated in into an action. This spans what and where, right? Yes, yeah. yes it does. Because what you're seeing up here at the, at the uh, inferior temporal is the, the highest level of evaluation of the what and where streams. This yeah. is for the objects and spatial uh, or orientation. Everything is brought together at that point and that's your experience. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask you something? It's a, yes. it's a hard topic, but... Um, the way you describe consci consciousness, uh, it seems to me like it's equal to awareness, like self-awareness. You're aware of your own actions. 
and your uh, how you are affecting the environment. Is that a correct assumption to make? What you're seeing in the upper part of the temporal lobe is your combined experience, the here and now. So you're going to have whatever you're seeing around you. You're going to have the objects that you've selected as being part of your conscious awareness. They're all in this, this uh, blackboard of, of your current experience. All right? All right. So that's being brought down to whatever, how I, I still can't quite imagine what the, the subcortical structures make of all this. This is the same thing that would make a lizard work. So it's getting some digested version of this to make decisions and decide on actions. That's what's projected to the forebrain. And then you, those are unfolded using your very clever cortex and wrapped around through the sensory stream. And then the lizard gets some sort of feedback of, of what, your, what your cortex makes of all this. The lizard's not real smart. It's smart enough to make lizards live. They live. I mean, they're doing quite well at it. So the, the cortex takes the universe and, and digests it to the point where a lizard can make sense of it. It, yeah, that, it, deals, that, with, it deals with very stupid uh, interpretations, but the, the cortex is good at, at explaining things to an idiot. <laughs> if it weren't so hard for us to figure out from the outside. <laughs> well, the, 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 Try to imagine what an idiot needs to know. That's that's why I've said before in the, the the forum is what does a lizard do? What does it think? And if you can figure that out, it may help you understand what it is the cortex is actually coming up with. Yeah. <laughs> well, but apparently it comes up with Beethoven. I don't know how. Oh, I can't explain that. I can't explain that. So let me ask you a question. Then on that diagram that you showed, Mark, um, there were all these arrows sort of coming out from, from the center and, and moving outward. But there's, is that consistent with the, yeah, yeah, there we go. Is that, uh, I mean, the way I read the, the dorsal stream is that it originates in striate cortex and, and moves sort of forward. Is this, that's a, how does that play with this? These are roughly, uh, what you're seeing for these arrows is the, um, uh, the, the major fiber bundles that are connecting parts of the uh, brain from one distant area to another distant area. There's a lot more short loops that connect every, every gyrus and adjoining gyruses. You can see in this, this, are these very, L1 simplified, this very simplified diagram here shows that there's short loops and longer loops and long yeah, loops. Yeah. These are the very, very long, uh, the longest distant fibers in the brain. Oh, okay. Are, and are, so these are all in L1, right? Yes, they're uh, L2 to L2 uh, connections that, that pass through L2 up into L1. Okay. This, so, is, uh, this is Paul's paper? It is, right? No, no, this is no. a different, uh, much earlier paper, but it's, uh, if you haven't read it, I strongly suggest you do so because it he, Mark's linking this this idea to affordances, the idea of affordances that Paul uses. Okay, which paper is that? Okay, uh, the location in. Oh, let's find out how it is. How um, mirrors make meaning. This is uh, linked in my post grids to maps, and this is like the third paper in our uh, second paper. You could okay. copy this and paste it in chat, Mark. All right, that's okay. I'm I'll write it. Write it down right now. Okay. I'll never Okay, thanks. Still done. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome. What okay. else we got that's fun? I'm not going to complain about Python because I just downloaded um, Python to, to start playing with the, the, uh, the tool to feed neurons into blenders as models. Oh, yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, if you want to link to that, I, I should be able to bring that up pretty quickly. That was cool. You should, yeah. You could even, I, I don't know if you saw this, Lucas, but there's, it's a, just a geeky neuroscience thing. They've got these standard um, neuron uh, 3D descriptions now that uh, you can put into Blender. Here, I'll, he's going to show it. Okay, here's the app. Um, what it is is a front end for Blender. You, you feed this thing with... Um, uh, uh, connections, and it makes neurons, model neurons. 
Oh wow! And you can make lots of them. As a matter of fact, this is a, a this is a demonstration where they were going to show how their this probe they're fabricating this thing in blue. Uh, it's a a probe for uh, sampling the activity of neurons in a column. And while they were at it, they put together a model. The this thing is loading, and it's it's sensitive to your mouse. Give it a moment. It's a real, it's it's actually a huge model. It takes a while to load. This is super cool. I don't know how they did it. It makes it look like it's an embedded video, but it's not. It's a it's an interactive 3D so environment. The <laughs> default mode for this is to sit and rotate, but you can zoom in. Let's go full screen on it. Okay, you can change your perspective. So this is running in Blender. And this is the, the blue thing is the probe they're modeling. And they wanted to see how, how it would fit in with, the, with a, a chunk of cortex. This is super cool. Is that a hyper column? Yeah. Um, yeah, I believe it is. But uh, they were more, con they tried to, instead of worrying about the, the ge geography of a column, they were more concerned about how it would fit in with the, uh, the somas. So they model the somas as a simple cylinder just to get the spatial orientation. And they're looking to see what, what it is they'll be sampling when they insert this in Cortex. Mm. Hmm, this could be interesting. Um, Scott Purdy who used to work for us. He made a, um, a neuro, very neuroscience, very neuroscience research focused uh, code base that took, uh, like mapped out uh, all the layers of cortex and showed all the different cell types and at all different layers. And it did this visually and you could interact with it. Um, and you could pick out the, pick the cell types that would show all the different papers that referenced evidence, that, you know, that the cell type was there and how it interacted with other things. And he would make connections from this cell to that cell. And each link would have references to papers um, there would be. I want, I want to see that. <laughs> I do too. I, I want to get it. Uh, I think I can get it running and get it open source. I don't think there is anything okay. sensitive about it, but uh, that's Blender, been on my back burner for a while. The Blender Neuron link is added to chat. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, it's on the forum too. Um, so I actually, Mark, already went through all the all this stuff I was going to talk about. Uh, so we're just hanging out at this point. Well, I was just saying that uh, to run this, I have to have Python up and I have to figure out how to get Python to load the model into Blender Neuron. And it's like, damn, I've been trying to avoid Python and I, I finally am stuck with it. <laughs> Can't avoid Python or JavaScript in today's software environments. I've been successful in JavaScript so far. I'm sorry. I, I, but Python, this, this is the one that brought me over the bridge. I got to deal with Python. Yeah. <laughs> is it Python 3 or Python 2? Uh, whatever you get when you load Anaconda, I'm, I assume it's three. Three, three. Yeah. That's better. It would be annoying if the brand new shiny download popped you into an obsolete model. It better not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I think we're going to hang it up. We got to do it in a meeting in 20 minutes, Lucas. So. Uh, yeah. Thanks for joining, Mark. It was nice talking to you again. <sighs> Oh, I See, keep... your your office is is doing that, and the lighting's terrible. But um, my base is there, so yeah, I got I got instruments in my office too. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> there should be more instruments in offices. <laughs> well, I, I'm wondering if I've, the space is really tight here, but I'm thinking of setting the xylophone up anyway. <laughs> well, uh, I, I want to see it. I want to see videos. <laughs> well, sure. Um, well, the first thing I did with that is I had to do C, uh, what is it, C A uh, or G A C. <laughs> what is that I, uh, from an old television broadcast, right? NBC. That's their. their... <laughs> I remember that. I heard that a lot when I was a kid. <laughs> yep. Well, it sounds better on chimes. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Um, okay, well, thanks, Mark, for joining. Thanks, Lucas, for joining. All right, thanks. See, See you guys. guys. Party on. Bye. Bye.